So a lot of people following this uh, video channel probably know by now that I am Jewish, but the actual channel is not really Jewish themed. But uh, if you haven't heard before, the reason it, it's called Bold Like a Leopard, because my original page on Facebook was called The Oozing Ruptured Spleen of Liberty, which was kind of a parody of the Bleeding Heart Liberal. So the Bold Like a Leopard was after a couple months when the first title wouldn't work, is a take on a passage in Ethics of Our Fathers, which is a Jewish text of the early, probably, I think, the 3rd century A.D. So that book has a passage that says you should be uh, light like an eagle, swift like a deer, bold like a leopard, and uh, I think strong like a lion in the service of the Lord your God. So that was that. That's basically the origin behind it. But I would say the majority of the channel doesn't really deal with religious themes or faith themes. But today we're going to talk a little bit about the state of the Jewish left, or what is basically a devolving and chaotic stream of stream of consciousness over there in that area, you know, the Jewish left. I've never, uh, you know, I, I'd never consider myself part of the Jewish left. Uh, I've always considered my religion separate from my politics. But this is a, from Rabbi Josh Uter. I don't know much about him, but he seems to be kind of like an opponent of the main social justice current that's coursing through the two larger denominations of American Judaism, which are the reform and conservative movements as well as there is also the reconstructionist movement and a couple of other ones that are a little more obscure but conservative judaism for those of you that no, don't know is just the name of the movement it's not in its nature a conservative movement it's just a that's the name of it and they basically are also known as traditional judaism and then there's the reform movement, which is generally a, a vast departure from the actual literal meaning of scripture. Okay, any scripture, whether it's the the biblical scripture or the uh, well, the interpretations of it, which are the Talmud and various commentators. So he puts this quote up, which is a little more relatable to to those of you that aren't really into theology. This is more into current events. He says he, he found this, and I don't know where he got it from, and I, I am going to ask him, but it says, no form of anti-Semitism is acceptable, but not all forms of anti-Semitism are alike. White anti-Semites are motivated by hatred of Jews and over desire for power. Black anti-Semites are motivated by anger over gentrification, police brutality, and slavery. So this is a passage that reminds me of the Animal Farms quote, Everyone is equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And I was just on uh, an interview interviewing uh, Corey Haywood, who is an author. I, I have that interview on my other channel, Razor Ray Live Wounds. And he was talking a lot about the uh, r ridiculous attitudes that he sees within his own community, which, are, which is the black community. And I see uh, this type of attitude within the Jewish community. And you see this in publications like the forward where they say what elizabeth warren can learn from julia salazar it says so she writes it's very possible that senator elizabeth warren of massachusetts will be elected president in 2020 <laughs> her economic agenda has great appeal and she is a passionate messenger and accomplished leader but if so it will be despite monday's potentially calamitous early misstep the unprecedented release of her DNA test results. Warren was responding to repeated attacks from President Trump about her claim to be of Cherokee and Delaware descent. The attack was first raised by Warren's 2012 Senate opponent, Scott Brown, who accused her of claiming Native American heritage to further her academic career. Trump eagerly picked up on the attack, nicknaming Warren Pocahontas during his campaign in his classically cruel race-baiting attack style. So you can see here there, you know, the foreword, which is a major uh, publication on the Internet, at least, uh, has has it was traditionally the Yiddish language paper 
of um, the Jewish community. I don't speak Yiddish because <laughs> it sounds ridiculous to me. But uh, they, they've basically adapted to English language probably in the last, uh, I don't know how many years. Uh, Trump, so, and, and like many of his attacks that packed a punch, the Pocahontas slur did double duty, appealing to racists while also calling Warren a liar and a hypocrite. Trump's attacks continued after he took office. He mocked her as recently as last week when he told the Kansas rally, I've got more Indian blood in me than Pocahontas, and I have none. Horrifyingly, Trump made similar remarks last November at an event to honor Navajo military veterans. So th this is the, the foreword. This is, this is something that I see very common among Jewish leftists, which is that they feel offended on behalf of people who they don't know. The Navajo military veterans when interviewed later, who, who yeah, they're, they're very old and they, they didn't seem really uh, interested in the ceremony when I was watching it. Uh, they, they said, well, we didn't really care what Trump was talking about with Elizabeth Warren. We didn't even know what he was talking about. And they didn't feel offended at all. And they said it was a, they had a great time, I guess. And, uh, you know, they were proud to serve in World War II. So it says, no doubt, in order to preempt such mockery in 2020, Warren released the results of a DNA test which found strong evidence of Native American ancestry going back six to ten generations. So I had a, an argument with somebody today on, on uh, Reddit. You can see the Reddit icon here. <laughs> so uh, this person saw a, a Reddit post that I I'd put up that, Talked a lot of that was the one that I did about uh, Native American mascots. It wasn't even that focused on Elizabeth Warren. And this person was trying to say, well, 164th, you know, the, he, she basically did her job. She proved she had Native American heritage. And this guy was just oblivious because, first of all, 164th is already saying that it goes back probably until the 18th century. Okay, because think about it. Elizabeth Warren, I believe, was born in the in the 40s. Okay, I think she was born in either the 40s or the 50s. Okay, her mother was, I think, born in the in 1910 uh, thereabouts. So that that's already one generation back. Imagine so one generation behind that would go back to the 1850s. Another generation back would go back to 1800. Another generation, so we're at four now. Five generations back around 1750, 1760. Six generations back goes almost to the 17th century. Okay, if, if, if you assume that everybody lives for 50 years, which we don't even know the names of these people in her, uh, on, on her family tree, or the person that supposedly had this genetic marker, because it doesn't say where it showed up. It doesn't say who this person is or what year they, they lived. But if you go back six generations, you basically come to, uh, you know, the time when British colonists were colonists were barely even settling in parts of Georgia and South, South and North Carolina. OK, so it's a pretty ridiculous premise. Uh, that, that's that's what I remember. OK, I, I don't even remember when. Yeah, so the early 1700s, the, the British colonists were, I think, mostly centered in Virginia, Massachusetts, uh, so may, maybe parts of New York, places like that. So we don't know exactly <laughs> how this could have uh, come into Elizabeth Warren's timeline or, 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 or family tree. But we do know that it's so far back that uh, it's, it's almost – Unbelievable that she would be able to know who this person is, because this was before there were actual records of Native American people. OK, it's it's uh, it's an interesting theory to find out who it was. But again, where do you even start? And for that matter, the DNA that was discussed was more from Central and South America, from what I saw of the report. And I did read the Boston Globe story. So. It's not like I'm not examining the evidence. But the move was a huge mistake. For starters, Warren's move demands to offend Native Americans and dismay progressives without neutralizing Donald Trump. So enough about that part. What, what does Julia Salazar have to do with this?
Okay. So the, Julius Salazar was a candidate for is is a candidate for New York State Senate, I believe. And it says Warren could have done very well to learn from the example of a less experienced politician, Julius Salazar, my friend to disclose, who ran for New York State Senate from a North Brooklyn district. Salazar's Jewish identity was aggressively challenged shortly before the September 13th Democratic primary in which she faced an eight term incumbent along with other parts of her background. Although Salazar answered journalists pursuing the story, she refused to feed the media firestorm, insisting that her message to voters was about local issues like rent control, not her persona. On election day, voters proved her right, ignoring the barrage of personal stories to elect the 27-year-old candidate who runs unopposed by, uh, in November by 17 points. It's not just Warren who should hope that the issues, issue of her ancestry fades, though her action will probably have the opposite effect. All Democrats hoping to unseat Donald Trump will be better off if the election is about competing visions for their country's future, not dueling spit, spit tests. So this is the classic case of people moving the goalposts. The Jewish left is one of the most neurotic publics that, that, you, could, that you could talk about, neurotic communities that you could talk about. Julius Salazar was basically the classic politician caught in a complete lie. She had claimed all sorts of connections to Jews through her father, saying that he was from conversos. Conversos are, are the, the Jews who, who became Catholic during the Inquisition, and then they basically practiced their religion under, uh, but basically underground. Uh, it later turned out from interviews with her family that her dad had nothing to do with that. It was basically, they, they, were, they were Catholic through and through, both uh, the mother and father. And at a certain point, she'd also, by mistake, claimed that she had Jewish heritage on her mother's side. And her mother, mother actually went on the record and said, no, we, we don't really have anything, you know, we're, we're straight up Catholic. <laughs> and it has nothing to do with that. Uh, and, and it later arose that Julia Salazar had once been, now, that, now, now she's a progressive, but she had once been a right-wing pro-Israel activist for Christians United for Israel. She had been a devout Christian at a certain point. And then after her visit to Israel, apparently her attitude shifted and she claims that she went through a conversion process at a certain point and that she had become basically enamored with the progressive opposition to Israel, uh, you know, so, such as the BDS movement. So how, how does that make any sense? How would you, why would you convert to a religion in order to oppose a significant portion of it? It doesn't make any sense. Here's some of the comments. Let's see if there's any that are, that really stick out. Most of them, <laughs> most of them are attacking her. There's this one guy who always shows up in this page and then they're, they're going back and forth and back and forth. This is basically the conversation on the Jewish uh, left. Uh, and they, they end up somehow melding the Elizabeth Warren issue into it. And, and then they start talking about white supremacists and, 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 uh, you know, Christians and blah, blah, blah. They're, they're going after each other because there's, a, there is also an element on the Jewish right that they, they completely agree with these uh you know the new people the proud boys the the gavin mckinnises and mike cernoviches of the political sphere right now so now you have people even this this nyla burton who i've seen articles by her who happens to be a, pr a practicing christian who writes for the forward as if she's a black jew so this is basically a game of racial and ethnic musical chairs Nobody's actually discussing the actual concepts behind Judaism, you know, uh, ideas that are, you know, they're millennia old. It's almost as if they're just using it as some sort of uh, costume in order to suit their agenda. You know, there's, um, there, there, there's of course, if, if you're looking at Judaism, there's the concept of the, of the, tenth, the, the Ten Commandments. The concept of, of uh, you know, Hasidism, which talks about the mystical na nature of God and the way that he permeates the entire world and, and talking about the 
actual science of the soul and and the elements of a person's personality and 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 the elements of of their of of how they exist you know thought speech and action those are the elements of it uh and and i think that there's the, the there's the seven values of a, of a person you know the, uh, some some interesting stuff some stuff that also has resonance with other with other philosophies around the world you know i don't think that judaism is the only religion that ta- addresses these to- topics but i think that you can't have you can't discuss a religion when you start to ignore its actual ideas and go more towards an identity and that's what i think is ruining the community and making it more and more difficult for people to identify with this as an idea and because people are trying to identify it with sort of this attitude and this and this skin that they wear so this author actually says stop weaponizing louis farrakhan against black jews and and i i have no idea why this is such an issue they even bring up steve king Okay, it says, meanwhile, anti-Semitic American politicians who actually have power, like Congressman Steve King, receive a negligible amount of coverage in comparison. Well, the issue with that is that Steve King, the only thing that he did is he, by mistake, retweeted uh, a post by somebody who was uh, a neo-Nazi from Britain. Okay, and then he apologized for it. Okay. And this person is actually claiming that, that Louis Farrakhan doesn't really have any institutional power. I would argue that somebody like Louis Farrakhan, somebody who I've said that I'm against censoring him, I think that he's a whore, I think he's a, he's a kind of a whack job, but I'm against censoring him. Uh, he does have institutional power. He has a massive religious organization behind him that funnels money to him. He also has uh, several businesses that he controls through it. He also has about seven or eight politicians, Democratic congressmen, who basically kowtow to him and, and, and you know, they, they bow to him in order to get his vote. So, yes, there, he does have institutional power. This person doesn't know what she's talking about. What she prefers to do as a black woman who wants to talk about, you know, it's not enough that she wants to use the black identity in order to... Uh, score points. She says, this is, this is her self-description. It says, Nyla Burton is a sexual assault survivor, advocate, and a student from Howard University. Follow her on Twitter at Yum Coconut Milk. I mean, what the, what the hell? And you say, you, I mean, let's look briefly at the comments here. Um, you know, people are, <laughs> people are basically roasting her over over coals here it's just ridiculous um but she, she does have some columns where she she talks a little about the experience of black people within the jewish community because there are there are black jews now let me let me explain to you something what's happening with the jewish left is that they are basically uh evaporating as a, as a real coherent political force it used to be 40 to 50 years ago that the jewish Community was very involved in the labor movements, you know, uh, unions and etc. I think that the the chief of the Uni- United Federation of Teachers, the largest teachers union in New York, was Jewish, and he was he was a almost a Jimmy Hoffa style guy for many years. Uh, controlled the union with an iron fist. That generation of people were very apt to be Zionistic. They used to be pro-Israel. They have basically gone the way of the dodo. They're gone. Uh, they're, I mean, I wouldn't say that they're gone, but they're, many of them are just older, over-the-hill, geriatric people. Uh, how many other ways can I say it? They're, they're, they're not re- they don't really reflect any uh, sustainable public within the Jewish community. And instead, in, 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 you know, in their stead, because many of these people espoused liberal values in the 60s and 70s, and they, they basically suppressed the religious element of their Judaism in favor of, a, of an ethnic identity, their children didn't really grow up with actual ideas, you know, what, what Jewish scripture, scripture means, what, who are the patriarchs, you know, Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Jacob, uh, who are the, you know, the, what, what, was, what were the core lessons of, the, the voyage 
from Egypt to the Holy Land, you know, the 40 years in the desert, those things, which I'm, I'm really saying at a very basic elementary school level, if you're, if you're religiously educated, a lot of those things are, are actually completely unknown to many, many young Jews because the reform and, and conservative congregations that these activist Jews in the 60s and 70s believed in, they, they, they basically ignored that aspect. They said, well, it's all about this organizing and, and, and social justice and everything. It already began back then, the 60s and 70s. So by the time that their kids grew up, they actually had a very weak uh, system of belief in Judaism, and they would end up uh, marrying people who weren't Jewish, okay, which among Orthodox Jews is, is, is very discouraged. And their kids would end up being, uh, you know, whatever. They, they, they would not end up being Jewish. It's typically, you know, it, it's very well known. A lot of them would marry Catholics and their kids would end up being either Catholic or atheist. So essentially an entire generation has basically been uh, decimated already 30 to 40 years ago because their parents had had a very uh, short dedication, sh small dedication to actual theological study of Judaism. Okay, and then their children, many of them also, it, it, it's like it just telescopes. So as 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 uh, uncommitted as their parents were, they were sometimes doubly. So now that, now there is a movement. There's a counter movement called the Baal Tshuva movement, which means the the movement of return, return to the faith, which has grown and it's brought some some Jewish people back to uh, you know knowledge of Judaism and study of the Torah, etc. That that movement is not really compensating for all of the people that have uh, drifted away, such that you have people like this Medea Benjamin, who protests in front of the I think, I think this is in front of the, it's either the treasury or just Steven Mnuchin's house. She's, she's, she's basically protesting in favor of Jamal Khashoggi, who was a Muslim Brotherhood reporter who many times called for the slaughter of Jews in Israel and whatever. So th this is, Medea Benjamin is Jewish, so she doesn't care. This is a person what what the the far left in in among the Jews is are people who decide well our ancestors were persecuted our ancestors who were Jews were persecuted we are going to stand up against persecution against all groups even to the point where we will ask for more persecution of our own brethren the other Jewish people in order to alleviate the persecution of other people and that's what people like like Medea Benjamin do. They, they may not say it the way that I'm saying it, but that's essentially what they're calling for. Uh, Medea Benjamin is basically somebody who says that her commitment to leftism, her commitment to communism, her commitment to worldwide social justice is more important than her actual uh, roots in in uh, in Judaism. Okay, so her her Jewish identity is it doesn't really mean anything. It's 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 almost just a placeholder. If she had been, uh, you know, German or something, she would have made up something like that. You know, so, some other guilt trip philosophy in order to justify her idiotic stunts. And I'm not saying that everything. I, you know, I think that she she does have a right to be anti-war. I'm 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 against uh, the U.S. getting involved in wars all around the world too, which I think is I'm fine with her doing that. But she is he, she's exactly the type of fraud that I'm talking about. Um, so we're, we're actually seeing the evaporation of actual progressive Jewish influence within the Democratic Party. That, now, I will say this, okay, there are a lot of these people who happen to be Jewish who are influential in the party. They're acting on behalf of the leftist philosophy. Uh, they, they don't actually believe in anything uh, that's, that's a religious system okay they, they've they, they've done exactly what Medea Benjamin has been doing and that is uh, throwing their faith into the the toilet and and saying well we're committed to all this social justice we're committed to tikkun olam tikkun olam meaning uh, basically fixing the world which is just a, a postmodernist agenda that has completely 
uh, overrided everything else within Reform and, and Conservative Judaism. It's almost as if they've <coughs> condensed their entire religion into uh, a, a quote taken completely out of context and not even and, and which doesn't even represent a main principle of traditional Judaism. So this is Representative Be Betty McCollum, who is, <coughs> she's from Minnesota. She's talking about apartheid Israel. There, there, there is a segment of the Jewish community that's speaking out against her. But unfortunately, I believe, <coughs> and you can, you can take it to the bank in my opinion, that even people in her Minnesota district who are who are Jewish who do believe who are who don't have the same opinions as her concerning the Israel Palestine conflict will end up voting for her because they themselves don't care about actual uh, principles they they have become identitarians for the Democratic Party because they they have this bizarre obsession with claiming that the right wing is anti-Semitic to the extent that they'll tolerate exactly what Josh Uter is talking about that. He, that, you know, that this is a quote, white anti-Semites are motivated by hatred of Jews and a desire for power. Black anti-Semites are motivated by anger over gentrification, police brutality, and, and slavery. That's exactly the type of attitude that these types of people are taking. They, they, they will, they don't, they have no problem with people hating them as long as they hate them for the right reasons. And then finally you have these progressive Zionists who I believe are they're the biggest joke in the world. Uh, a couple of them, I think, have banned me because, from their Twitter. So I've been uh, blocked. And they go to these uh, stupid marches and they try, you know, there's there's seven or eight of them. And they, they go there and they try to say, well, Zionists can also be progressive. If you look at progressive marches today, if they care at all about Zionism, they're not for it. Zionism is, like I said, a ba it's basically a political philosophy that has kind of passed its day. The fact that the, the state of Israel was established makes Zionism an, an, an obsolete uh, philosophy. If you want to actually stand on principle, which these people can't, you would say that just like the Israeli people, the Jewish people achieved the sovereign state, we should hope that every every country in the world should have its sovereignty. Every country in the world should have its self-determination, should not have people interfering in its business and constantly harassing them like happens at times to Israel. OK, th those of you that are progressive watching aren't going to like what I'm saying. But the, the ideas that Zionism promulgated <coughs> during the early days of the state of Israel, you know, self-determination and everything, self-determination, by the way, against the British Empire nowadays. We, we, the people who benefited from that, would say, should say, in my opinion, that just like the Israelis deserve self-determination, so does Britain now. Britain, that used to be the colonial power in the Middle East, they deserve self-determination from the EU. These progressive people will never recognize that. Those are the ones, by the way, that you see, you see a lot of these people on the alt-right are saying, Open borders for Israel now. Open border because they they claim that the progressive Jews are you know they're they're actual Zionists and they want they they want open borders for the U.S. but not for Israel. In reality, <coughs> let me tell you something: the majority of these progressive Jews do stand on the principle of open borders worldwide. It doesn't matter if it's Israel or if it's Italy or if it's Spain. They, they actually are more committed to the idea of open borders than they are to self-preservation. So the, the alt-right doesn't know what it's talking about. The, uh, some of the more, you know, hardcore elements on the right that are against, you know, the, the, uh, what I would call like the Buchanan wing. They think that the, you know, a Zionist is a Zionist is a, you know, whatever. But the truth of the matter is that the Zionist left those that, that nowadays are calling for open borders and things like that, they are falling apart. Nobody wants to be be participating in a movement that doesn't have any consistency. It, does, it doesn't make any sense. Why would you go and protest uh, <coughs> against the president who has some of the more, um, you know, more friendly policies towards the Israelis than, than other presidents, you know, wh whether it's Obama or whether it was 
I, I know Reagan had had certain issues with Israelis when he was president. Uh, Pre president Trump has been pretty pretty uh, has a, had a very good relationship with with Netanyahu. Okay, and he's had a very bad relationship with the Palestinians. I think both Israelis and Palestinians would agree to what I just said. So these people, they go and protest and they, they, they say, you know, uh, don't accept money from the NRA and march for our lives and the women's march and etc. Uh, they did. They gain nothing from it. People don't even care. And they ended up <coughs> supporting a movement that was basically dominated by. Uh, people like Tamika Mallory, the, the 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 very same people that supported Farrakhan. So uh, I think that's about it. And there's more that I could talk about with this, but we are running long. And maybe I'll talk about it a different time after a while, because honestly, how much more of this could you guys take? So that's just my personal take on, on the unraveling of the Jewish left, which doesn't really have any coherence or unity anymore. Please like this video, subscribe to the channel, subscribe to my other channel, Razor Ray Live Wounds. By the way, check out the interview I had with Corey earlier. And uh, also comment and share. And I'll talk to you guys later. Have an uh, enjoyable Friday.